Well, uh, this uh, ACE 320 uh, jet, jet oriented course, uh, as I said, was designed a few years ago as a previous step for our um, A320 cyber ready course that we are offering uh, in global training aviation. And the intention of this uh, JOC course is just to give you a general idea, uh, first of all, general parts about uh, what's the main difference between flying a propeller and a jet airplane. And after this first part, we'll uh, introduce our flight students into the um, uh, A320 indeed as, as aircraft systems, uh, maneuvers, and as I said, just uh, to get you into the uh, A320 or A320 stuff, just to make your typewriting course much, much easier. So the minimal level required for this course is uh, a commercial pilot, IFR license or similar. And this is an introductory course to jet power aircraft based on A320 and is divided on uh, nine sections and five parts. Each of these conference, each of this part uh, will take will last uh, between the 45 50 minutes. Well, on the part one, uh, today we're going to, uh, to talk about this first part, uh, part one. Uh, we find three different sections. Section one, which is uh, jet and propeller uh, differences. Section two, uh, jet aircraft aerodynamics. Uh, on the section three, we find performances affecting jet airplane, jet, jet aircraft. And this first part, as I say, is the, uh, is the generic part for uh, every uh, jet airplanes as a Boeing uh, 737-A320. After this first part, we'll uh, get into the uh, A320 systems part indeed, which is more, uh, it's much more a focus on the um, A320 systems. Well, on the part two, uh, we find the section four and section five, which is uh, the section four, uh, Airbus 320 aircraft general. Section five, A320 auto flight systems. In the part three, we'll talk uh, about the uh, flight control system systems, which is quite interesting part just to, to figure out, just to find, uh, find out how this uh, fly-by-wire system works in the A320 and which uh, flight control laws uh, we have in this, uh, in this um, great airplane. On the part four, uh, we find the section number seven and eight, which is electrical system and hydraulic system is very important uh, to learn how this uh, system works uh, on the A320. And uh, last but not least, uh, we'll get into some uh, maneuver stuff, maneuver uh, as an intuition, as I say, to, for the tire rating course, we'll learn some basic concepts, uh, quite interesting, quite important um, for, the, uh, for all of us uh, before getting to the, uh, the tire rating course. Well, this is a, uh, well, just a few notices. This virtual course is a tool to ease your review on the requ required subjects for the tire rating course, as I said. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you may have to pass an exam. Well, <laughs> there is no exam for this uh, course, so uh, uh, be relaxed. Uh, try to, uh, to get as much as you can from this, uh, from this core course. And well, yeah, there is no, there is no exam. And the use of this course is limited to uh, students at Global Training Aviation. Well, so if you are ready, let's get into the first part of the uh, jet-oriented course, which is jet and proper differences. What's the, the, the main difference? Uh, what do you think uh, was more challenging for pilots flying an approach which is, uh, between flying a jet propeller, uh, a jet airplane or a propeller airplane? What do you think is well, in my opinion, it's quite more challenging flying a jet airplane, and we'll see how, uh, and we'll see why, and we'll see what's the main difference during an approach, during approach profile between flying a jet airplane and a propeller. Well, basically, there are six, uh, six main differences between a jet air aircraft and a propeller during an approach and landing. The jet airplane is worse off than a propeller in maintaining the approach profile and correcting errors during the approach. Uh, 
The, the main reason is the, this, this first difference, which is the momentum. Momentum is the, uh, uh, as you can remember, is the uh, mass of the airplane multiplied by the, uh, the speed. So we all know, know this, well, we all know, call this concept as a airplane inertia, which means that uh, during an approach, uh, we need to uh, reach our final approach fix and our 1,000 feet. Uh, as a, uh, a stable approach, which is uh, uh, on profile, on glide slope, on localizer, uh, on our approach speed and the uh, engines engaged above either. Uh, if we don't comply with all these concepts, concept, we must to uh, go around and cancel the approach. Um, all this stuff, all this uh, concept stem from the very, very beginning from the approach, just think that uh, if we reach our final profix uh, uh, above our speed with over speed condition is going to be uh, quite difficult to uh, slow down and reduce because of this momentum this uh, airplane's uh, inertia when we fly a propeller this all this stuff is much easier to correct so be careful and bear this concept uh, in mind what's the momentum what's the airplane's inertia well, well, we'll talk about this uh, concept later on more in deep. Well, second difference is this speed stability. Uh, we'll talk about win what's wind lift values, engine response, rate acceleration and deceleration, slipstream effects, and power on stall speed. Well, what's the our momentum? Well, the jet aircraft has a greater momentum than the lighter and a slow propeller driven aircraft. Therefore, the responses of a jet aircraft to changes in flight path are much slower and sudden changes and sudden changes are virtually impossible. That's why it's so important uh, when we all uh, start flying in the flight school, our, our instructor said, think ahead the airplane, try to fly ahead the airplane. Um, try to anticipate so to uh, what's gonna happen during the, uh, from the very beginning on the approach, since uh, we have to reach our uh, final profix with uh, our speed, our speed within limits, our speed uh, under control, just to configure, configure our airplane for this uh, landing phase. So, and bear in mind always how, uh, what's your momentum? What's your airplane's inertia? And uh, when we fly a jet airplane, it's more challenging, it's more difficult to uh, slow down if we reach the, one of these stop lines, one of these points, a final profit or minimum uh, in overspeed condition. So it's going to be really difficult to, to reduce and slow down to configure and extending flaps and landing gear if we, if we reach uh, this final profit in an uh, overspeed condition. Well, uh, what's speed stability? It's the behavior of the speed after disturbance at a fixed power setting. The speed is said to be stable if after it has been disturbed from its trim state, it returns naturally to its uh, original speed. What's the uh, wind lift values? The jet aircraft straight, uh, straight wind produces less lift than the propeller aircraft's straight wind. Well, most of the uh, commercial, commercial jet airplanes has uh, sweat winds uh, designs. So just think about this uh, Boeing 737, A320, all these sweat winds airplanes has less lift than a propeller sweat wind. The sweat wind experiences a faster increase in drag penalty than lift, resulting in a higher sink rate at uh, lower speed. We, we, we'll see more in deep um, later during this, uh, during this conference, conference, how will affect these wind lift values during, uh, during the approach. Well, the, the engine response rate acceleration and deceleration is a, is a, is a big issue, it's a, it's a key point during the approach that will have a, a big effect uh, when we fly um, and A320 during, during an approach. The jet engine has a poor acceleration response at low RPM speeds uh, known as lag. And that's why we all 
uh, know that we have to, we must to reach our 1,000 feet uh, AGL above ground level uh, with this uh, stable approach criteria, which is, um, as I said before, on localizer, on glide slope, the airplane full configured for landing, and the engine power engaged above idle thrust. That's, uh, and the reason is exactly this one, the engine response, if we uh, need to, to go around and uh, cancel our approach and make a go around, uh, we need to have our engine thrusts uh, well engaged above the idle thrust. And that way, in case of go around, our engine response will be much, much quicker. And that that's, uh, doesn't happen when we fly a propeller, uh, when, uh, with a pro propeller uh, airplane, the engine thrust is much quicker, it's, it has a rapid response. Well, uh, what's the slipstream effect? Uh, when we fly a propeller airplane, the, uh, the, uh, this propeller slipstream produces an immediate extra lift value over the winds at a constant airspeed, which is, uh, well, in a jet airplane, we don't have this uh, slipstream, we don't have this propeller, so our lift will not be exceeded. Uh, we, we, won't, we won't get any uh, extra lift due to this, uh, this uh, propeller turn. Well, what's the uh, power and stall speed? The speed, well, the stall speed is significantly lower when the engine power is increased or, or on, for a propeller air, aircraft because it generates slipstream with an increased airflow speed over the wind and increase the lift. That refers to the, to the basic, to the same concept on a pro propeller airplane due to these uh, propeller turns, that will uh, generate uh, uh, this slipstream. And this slipstream will generate, will increase our lift, which is, which is uh, a positive, positive effect during the approach. But when we fly a jet airplanes, since we don't have any propeller, of course, we, we won't get any this, uh, uh, increase uh, uh, a slipstream effect, a slipstream uh, increase in our lift. So for a jet air aircraft, which does not produce a lift stream over the wind, the stall speed is virtually unchanged during, during the approach. Well, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this graphic, uh, what we find is uh, exactly what we are talking about, which is where, where piston engine is normally operating in the range of 40 to uh, 7 percent. So we say that uh, when we fly a piston a propeller airplane, we we will fly in between this uh, between this 40 and uh, 70 percent uh, RPM range. So, but when we fly a jet airplane, our power, our engine thrust will be always between uh, maybe 80, 85, and 100 percent. And that's the reason is when we said before, we reviewed before, is that we need to reach this uh, 1,000 feet uh, above ground level in case of uh, India mic condition, instrumental conditions, with the engine's thrust well engaged above the, uh, above the idle thrust. Well, uh, let's get into the uh, part, uh, well, section two of this uh, part one, uh, that's um, jet aircraft uh, aerodynamics. Uh, th th these are quite basic, basic concepts, but they are, they are all quite important. Um, and, and they are uh, concepts that we have, we must have in, in mind always during an approach, when we fly an approach, and especially this uh, A320, Airbus 320. Well, we all know what's drag. It's the uh, resistance to motion of an object through the, the air. And we, well, we can talk about two different types of drug. The first one is profile drug, which which increases directly with the with our speed speed because the faster an aircraft moves through the air, the more air molecules this surface encounter. And this profile drug is uh, rated at high speed, as we can we can imagine. Uh, on the other hand, we find our what's the induced drug is caused. This drug is caused by creating lift. Uh, with a high angle of attack that exposes more of the aircraft's surface to relative airflow and is associated with wind tip vortices. Well, we all know what's the uh, windlet, or well, sometimes we all 
this this surface is called a uh, shard lens. Uh, we find in the uh, many of you we have the opportunity of finding the Airbus 320 neons, which has a two two meters length shard lens or wind lens. Well, this 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 surface. Uh, was designed just to, to save fuel and uh, to be to be honest it's safe uh, between 3.5 and 4 4 percent of the fuel burn which is uh, roughly uh, 700 tons uh, of uh, co2 reduction per, per year which is roughly the co2 produ produced by around 200 cars per year annually so Actually, this well, yeah, these windlets or sidelets uh, save quite a lot of, uh, of of fuel. This is a, it's an additional lifting uh, surface on the air, air, aircraft. The windlets convert some of the otherwise waste energy in, in the wind tail vortex to an upper end thrust. The windlets windlets reduce the intensity of wind tail vortices, less weight turbulence, and lower speed. And what about drag? Reduction. These wind legs or sidelets uh, reduces the required takeoff distance, which is good for us as well. And as I said, reduce the fuel consumption, especially uh, in long ranges. Uh, as a big number, but well, this fuel consumption will reduce uh, as around four percent. Well, uh, as a disadvantage, on the other hand, we find for pilots, these sidelets, especially when we are landing in a high crosswind condition, uh, you will see when we, you will see the difference which, between flying the A320 with uh, sidelets and without sidelets. With this surface, with sidelets, it moves a bit more, especially uh, in, in crosswind conditions, so it's a bit more challenging for us just to, to keep the airplane well centered uh, aligned with the runway. And you, you will learn, you will see how to some landing techniques uh, with these uh, Charlotte uh, surfaces on the, uh, tire, on the A320 tire rating course in, uh, in global training aviation. Well, swept winds, as I said, 90% uh, of the commercial uh, airplanes now, uh, they, have, uh, they all have swept winds uh, design. These swept winds uh, is uh, high speed, high performance cruise. Uh, with wind design, uh, the swept winds designed increases our critical mach critical speed, uh, delays the airflow or over wind from going supersonic. Uh, between the uh, well, among the advantages, we find the uh, high Mach cruise speeds, which is good. Uh, stability in turbulence. This is quite this is quite uh, quite tricky concept. Uh, you know. Ironically, the uh, disadvantage of the swag winds is its poor lift qualities, as I said before, which leads itself to an advantage uh, in that is uh, more stable in turbulence. So we say that, yeah, this wet sweat wind design has poor lift uh, qualities, but due to this poor lift quality, it, it, this, 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 this disadvantage turns into an advantage uh, especially when we fly in uh, turbulence, uh, turbulence conditions, because uh, our airplane is less responsive to uh, to up uh, flying these uh, turbulence conditions. Well, this uh, among the disadvantages of the swift winds, we find uh, as, I, as I said before, the poor poor lift qualities, high stall speeds due to the poor poor lift. Uh, speed stability as a consequence of the poor lift at low, lower power, lower speeds, and uh, the wind, wind tip stalling tendency that, uh, as you can imagine, the, the straight wind airplane has a wind root uh, stall tendency instead of wind tip. Well, in this, uh, Graphic we find uh, well. This is just to 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 yeah to highlight the the, the, the this concept that the uh, in gen in general terms the straight wind airplane has a great greater greater and better uh, lift uh, qualities that uh, our straight wind airplanes. So for the same angle of attack, uh, 
if we take a look uh, from this uh, angle of attack, for the same angle of attack, the, the lift coefficient uh, for a sweat wind airplane will be much lower than comparing with a sweat wind from the same angle of attack. So this is a disadvantage that we have on, the, on our sweat wind airplanes. Well, uh, talking about the stall properties in a sweat wind, you know, uh, stall uh, first, of course, and the wind tips. Uh, one of the consequences is uh, when we fly a sweat wind airplane is that the, uh, the center of pressure will move forward of the center of gravity, which will uh, create a no up tendency. Uh, yeah, stall first and the wind tips, and this uh, remember this this center of pressure will move always forward. That's why uh, when we enter in a stall condition uh, in the A320, uh, we'll notice a pitch up moment. Compared with a uh, well, a single thread or tapper wind, uh, the stall will occur uh, on the wind root first instead of the wind tips, and in, in this case, the center of pressure will will move rearward. Well, uh, let's talk about the pitch power moment, which is a really very very important concept uh, when we fly the A3, the Airbus three twenty. Uh, you you will learn on our well on the on the a320 type rating course and in global training aviation uh, you will learn how to recover the airplane from a, a stall condition and this uh, this is a memory item that we will review the unit unit the type rating course and since the engines on the a320 the engines are mounted under the wing uh, the first step on the memory item of from the stall recovery is a uh, Take the pitch down below the below the horizontal line. And second step is the winds level, and the third step will uh, thrust levers uh, thrust levers thrust increase smoothly, and then uh, check a speed brake brake is retracted. And if we are below twenty thousand feet, we can we can we may consider extending the flaps one just to increase our lift. But it's quite important to. To bear in mind this this first point, pitch down, winds level, and thrust levers increase, and the reason is, uh, exactly the reason is that one, since our engines are mounted mounted under the wings, as soon as we are increasing power, increasing the thrust, will uh, create a pitch up moment. Uh, well, all the forces of thrust and drag are not acting through the same point. On the, on the second step, a change in the thrust, uh, change in thrust in straight and level flight can lead to a, a pitching tendency of the aircraft. So, bear in mind, always remember this, where are your engines mounted on the A320 under the wings, and every change in the power that you, you made on the thrust lever will create a pitch up, pitch up or down moment on the airplane. Well, uh, we have on the uh, A320, we have as well, uh, as you can imagine, high lift devices, tra uh, trailing edge flaps, which is called fowler flaps. Uh, we do have as well uh, leading edge flaps, that's uh, Kruger flaps, increase the lift by creating longer wing core line and extending our chamber and area. Uh, we have as well some, uh, slots uh, over, or, over the winds, which prevents or delay the separation of the airflow boundary layer and therefore produce an increase in the coefficient of our uh, lift maximum. Well, we have as well, uh, well, uh, each wind we have, we have five spoilers per wind. Uh, this spoiler will, uh, we can use them for uh, as, as a speed brakes, roll control or ground lift dampers. In the first case, for in flight for a speed brakes, uh, we'll use the three center surfaces. For the run control, uh, once landing will, uh, well, sorry, in flights, for roll control, we'll use the four outer surfaces. And once landing, you know, the landing roll, we'll use the, uh, as a ground spoiler, we'll use these all, uh, all surfaces, the five, um, five spoilers. You know, the landing roll, uh, you will learn during the time waiting, then during the landing roll, 
as soon as this uh, ground spoiler is deployed, it will send the, the sign to the auto brake for, for auto brake act activation and, and ensure the, uh, the, the braking, braking action during the landing run. Well, what's, what's the, uh, we all know what's that role and Joe Damper. That role is oscillatory stability associated with the sweat wind jet aircraft. And it's basically a combination of jowing and rolling motions. That role is caused by the sweat winds. And these points are quite important for pilots. How to recover from our, that roll condition? Uh, if we try to recover from that roll applying uh, aileron, that will make worse the situation. So the recovering action, the recovering technique from that role is applying, applying rudder instead of aileron. So Joe Dampers uh, prevent this, uh, this uh, that role. Of course, uh, we have Joe Dampers on the A320. Well, more uh, basic uh, aerodynamic concepts. Uh, you know, what's Mach number? is a true airspeed indication given as a percentage relative to the local speed of sound. The Mach number is the relation between the true, uh, true airspeed divided by the local speed of sound. And as you know, uh, the local speed of sound is, uh, depends directly from the temperature. is 38.94 multiplied by a square root of the temperature. And that means that as soon as we are climbing, as soon as we are gaining altitude, the temperature drops and this local speed of sound will decrease. So as we are climbing uh, for the same task, for the same uh, indicated airspeed, as soon as we are climbing, seeing the temperature drops, our Mach number will, will increase. Well, what's Mach critical is the aircraft Mach uh, speed at which the airflow over a, over a wind becomes sonic. The subsonic aircraft experience a rapid racing drag above the uh, critical Mach number. And because the aircraft engines do not have available power to maintain that speed and lift values under these conditions, the aircraft suffers a loss of, uh, of lift. So passing this Mach critical, our drag will increase and we lose uh, quite a lot of uh, lift. Well, characteristics uh, of a critical Mach number, uh, the initial Mach buffet, increasing drag, and nose down change attitude will occur, which is called Mach tack. Well, coffin corner. This is quite important concept as well. Uh, we all uh, know what we have heard quite quite a few times uh, what, what's a coffin corner uh, well this this concept is quite important as well especially when we fly uh, the a320 at um, high altitude high level as flight level 370380 or 390 and especially when we are flying in high gross weight conditions well coffin corner occurs at an aircraft's absolute sailing where the speeds at which Mach number buffet and pre stall buffet are coincident and they are difficult to distinguish between. Therefore, uh, a margin is imposed between an aircraft operating and absolute sailing. For a constant Mach number, which is the normal mode of speed management when we are in cruise level, the indicated airspeed decrease with attitude due to decreasing local speed as well. We, we, we talked about this concept in the previous slide. Uh, to prevent this uh, indicated airspeed from this decreasing to the stall speed, uh, the Mach number must be increased, which results in increasing uh, as well the indicated airspeed. So at this point, the coffin corner restricts the attitude attainable by the aircraft. You will see in this in this graph quite quite uh, it's, it's quite good to, to understand what's going to happen uh, exactly in the coffee corner we find uh, where we find this in, in this graph in this picture is the uh, this is our coffee corner area which is basically the vs is the st stall speed line and the this mmo is the over speed line so when we are 
flying in our coffin corner area is where the low speed buffet store limit and the high speed buffet mag limit lines meet. And this coffin corner area is an, is an area within, the, with, within our flight envelope where the airplane, the aircraft finds very difficult, very hard to maintain level flight. So when we talk about um, absolute sailing in this case and service sailing, we can say that uh, our absolute sailing is an attitude on which the, our rate of climb goes to zero and our service sailing, our rate of climb for a jet power airplane goes to uh, uh, roughly 500 feet per minute and when we talk about piston power airplane is around 100 feet per minute. So difference between absolute sailing and service sailing? Well in the first one is an aircraft maximum attainable attitude flight level at which the Mach number buffet and pre stall buffet of course coincidentally that's the, our coffin corner. An aircraft is unable to climb above this uh, absolute sailing. As I said, our rate of climb and this attitude is zero. And on the other hand, on the service sailing is the maximum service sailing. Um, aircraft impose and route maximum uh, attitude of flight level, which provides a safety margin below, below uh, our absolute sailing. So yeah, big number, absolute sailing, rate, rate of climb zero service sailing has uh, some margin of maneuvering uh, above uh, below our absolute sailing and we can say that our rate of climb this service sailing is could be roughly 500 feet per minute on the on the um, a320 well uh, section three of this uh, first part of our uh, jet oriented course which is the performance is affecting to to uh, all the jet airplane, airplane, jet aircraft, not only to the Airbus 320, but also to the Boeing 737 on every airplane that 90% uh, of the airplanes that you will fly in uh, in commercial aviation. Well, this is quite a review as a refreshment to the uh, basic performance concept that I'm quite sure that you are quite aware of, uh, you are aware about this, and you all are quite familiar with all these concepts. Uh, the first one is uh, TORA, which is uh, take of run available. It's the usable length of the runway available that it's treatable for the ground run of an air, air, airplane taking off. In most of the cases, this, this uh, concept corresponds to the uh, physical length of the runway. What's TORA take of distance available is our take of run available plus the clear way. We, we'll talk about this, what's the clear way concept. Well, uh, in general terms, the uh, take of distance available is not to exceed, to exceed 1.5 uh, of the uh, take of run available, take on run, take of run available distance. What's the stop weighing? Well, it's an area on the ground beyond the end of the take of run, which is prepared and designed as a suitable area in which an airplane can stop the airplane in the in the case of event of a reality re takeoff. This, this stop weight is provided for infrequent, infrequent use and it needs uh, not have the same bearing, same uh, wearing qualities and the runway which is associated. This stop weight can be some uh, land drainage, ground grading, or even light, light paving, uh, which can be required in, required in case of uh, aborting or stopping uh, takeoff, in case of rejected takeoff. Well, what's clear way? It's an, an area that may we provide beyond the, the end of the takeoff run available. This area must be free of objects uh, because it's the area when after our lift off, our, after our rotations, um, we'll use this area maintaining our speed B2 plus, 20, plus 10 or plus 20, or in case of single, or in case of engine failure, or in case of single engine climb out, our, our speed will be, will be B2 or our current speed, which is the higher. And we use this clear way just to, during our initial climb phase, until our uh, screen height, which is uh, 35 feet on dry runways or 15 feet 
in case of a wet runway. So this clear way area must be always clear of uh, any objects, objects or obstacles. This clear way, it provides an area over the which the airplane, the airplane can safely transit uh, from lift off to the required screen head. And this area may be land, water, or and maybe extend outside the aer aerodrome boundary indeed. Well, once the ASTA accelerate stop distance available, uh, that's an emergency distance available, also known as the accelerate stop distance available, or ASTA is the length of the takeoff run available. Usually, uh, the physical length of the runway plus the length of the stop way available. So this accelerate stop distance available is the takeoff run available plus our stop way stop way that we might use in case of re reality takeoff. Well, landing distance available, this is a takeoff run available displaced threshold. We talk about this uh, concept more in deep in the next slides. Uh, well, this graphic is quite, quite, uh, quite good to, for understanding what what's uh, all these basic performance concepts are about. This, uh, we, have, we find our landing distance available in the first point. We have talked about uh, what's our take of run available. What's our ASDA accelerate stop distance, which is the, our take of run available plus our stop weight. And finally, we find our, uh, what's our, we have talked about our uh, takeoff distance available, which is the takeoff distance uh, until, well, our takeoff run available plus our clear way. Remember, our clear way is the area uh, that we'll use to during our initial phase, initial climb phase until reaching our screen height, this, this 35 feet attitude in case of runway dry or 15 uh, feet attitude in case of runway wet. Well, some uh, basic uh, concepts, performance, performances concept about the, our speeds. We find, we, we all know what's, uh, we're quite familiar with our, what's the minimum uh, and stick speed. Uh, it's possible to get airborne uh, on all engines and to climb out without any hazard. This B1 speed is quite important um, when we fly, well, not only the, the A320, when we fly every airplane, and especially during the takeoff phase, phase we have to uh, bear in mind always at all times, what's our B1 decision speed? So in, a, in the event of an engine failure during the takeoff roll uh, at which it is possible to continue to take off and achieve our screen height with normal takeoff distance available, or to bring the aircraft to a full stop in case of emergency within our uh, emergency distance available, within our accelerate stop distance available. So remember, uh, our, just before our V1 speed, uh, we it's good. We might take the we must take the decision to to abort, to cancel or abandon our takeoff and bring the aircraft to a stop, a uh, full stop within our accelerated stop distance. Remember, this is the takeoff run, run available plus the stop way, or passing above our, this V1 speed is good. We must to get, continue our takeoff and get airborne, airborne safely with single engine and uh, achieving our screen height at uh, V2 speed and then uh, fly the airplane safely, get a safe attitude, do the travel shooting, inform ATC, go with the ECAM, uh, and then we'll, uh, you will learn how to cope with this uh, engine failure problem, engine failure during take of emergency, you know our time rating course in GTA how to cope with this, this emergency profile more, more, more in, in deep. Well, what's the uh, BMCG, our uh, minimum control speed on ground uh, for a multi-engine aircraft as a constant power setting and configuration at and about this possible to maintain directional control of the aircraft around uh, normal vertical axis by using our rudder to maintain runway heading 
after failure of uh, uh, one of the uh, off centering uh, engine. R remember that B1 cannot be less than BMCG, and B1 cannot be greater than uh, BR or uh, BM with, with BMBA, which is maximum brake energy. So say that uh, the, our B1 decision and speed is higher than uh, minimum control on ground, but lower than our, uh, will be less than our uh, rotation speed. Well, maximum brake energy, BMBE, is the maximum speed on the ground which a stop can be accomplished uh, within the energy capabilities of the brakes. We found the, our rotation speed, BR speed, is, a, is the speed at which the pilot initiates rotation during takeoff to achieve B2 and the screen height, even with an engine failure. BR is uh, either greater or equal to B1, but never less uh, than B1, as uh, we, uh, we said before. Well, minimum control, uh, BMCA is the minimum control speed in the air for a multi-engine aircraft in the takeoff and climb out configuration at and above, which is possible to maintain directional control on the aircraft around the normal vertical axis by using a rudder after failure of one of the uh, engines. Well, uh, BMO, uh, maximum operating speed, or MMO, is the maximum operating speed permitted for all operations. It's normally associated with jet airplanes. Well, when you talk about this, uh, this, this, this graphic is is quite is quite good to understand. Now we are going to talk about what's the difference, how the flaps extension will affect to us during the uh, during the takeoff roll. Uh, usually in the in the A320 we use for takeoff uh, configuration one flaps one or flaps two. So in the first case uh, for flaps one, say that we are under this uh, under this. Uh, and in this condition, flaps five degrees, which refers in our case for A320 flaps one. In this case, our takeoff run will be rated. We'll, so we'll use a longer distance uh, on a, a longer takeoff run required with flaps one. But once we get airborne, our climb performances will, are going to be greater, and be much better than that. Uh, on the other hand, when we use flaps two for takeoff, well, in this case, our take on run require our take on visa will be sorted. So we'll get airborne quite earlier that comparing with flaps one. But once in flight, our climb performance is going to be much worse. So, well, depending on, depending on what we need, depending on which airplane we are taking off from, we are operating. Uh, if the uh, runway length is an issue, we, have, we are taking off from a short runway. Maybe it's a good option to use flaps too. If we don't have any uh, high terrain surrounding the airport, but on the other hand, for example, if we are taking off from a Madrid, Madrid airport, which, which has a quite long runway, more than 3,000 meters, but we are taking off from runway 36, taking towards north, and we find some uh, high terrain in this north part of, the, uh, of Madrid, Runway length is, is not an issue, so uh, well, we can imagine that it take, taking off uh, using flaps one is the best option because our runway length is not an issue, so we can use longer distance, longer takeoff run in our, um, we can spend more time during the landing, during the takeoff roll, but once uh, we're in flight, our flight performance is going to be much better. That's the main, uh, main difference between uh, using flaps one or flaps two unit takeoff. So that's basically all the main concept about how does the use of flaps affect uh, the takeoff performances. The effects of flaps on takeoff performance and climb performance varies between different aircraft types, especially uh, in, in, between sweat winds and straight wind turboprop. The maximum takeoff flaps may be used to reduce the uh, ground takeoff run, as we said, require when the field length is limiting or the runway surface is poor. So 
when we are taking off from a short uh, length runway or when this runway surface is poor, maybe it's a good option to take, take off using flaps too for takeoff. So we'll get air war uh, earlier. But remember that our, that our climb performances will, will be worse. So we will we'll have more drag uh, once we get airborne. However, uh, as the next point said, however, airborne climb performance may be compromised due to an increase in drag, which reduces the lift drag ratio and results in a reduced rate of climb performances. The use of flap setting outside the takeoff range would, inc would increase aerodynamic rack during the ground roll, causing a slower acceleration that results in an increased takeoff run required. And then once airborne will significantly degrade performance because of this poor lift drag ratio. That's the going back to the uh, previous concept that we have been talking about on the previous slide. So, uh, Main concept, uh, main concept, uh, when you we use flaps two for takeoff, our takeoff run required will be sh shorter, will spend less time during the takeoff take roll, but once in flight, our drag will, will be higher, so our climb performance is not going to be much worse. If we, use, if we use flaps one for takeoff, we'll spend more time on the runway, our takeoff run required will be longer, but once in flight, we'll, we'll, we'll get better climb performances compared with uh, flaps one. That's the main difference. Well, uh, this is slide is quite, quite interesting, quite important, relevant speeds that we should be familiar with uh, when we fly the uh, um, jet uh, sweat wing uh, airplane. What's the difference between a BX and BY? BX speed is uh, the, ma the maximum or best angle of flying. And this is what we call on the Airbus 320 green dot speed. Our green dot speed is the maximum lift drag radio speed. You will have this speed indication on your uh, PFD, primary flying display, and uh, you will get quite familiar with uh, during the uh, type rating course. Well, what's BY speed? Uh, it's the best rate of climb speed. It's the highest vertical speed that gains height in the shortest time. So, um, on the other hand, BX is the uh, will gain this height in the shortest distance. That's the main difference between BX and BY. Well, so we can imagine this, the, we can make this question, what's climb performance, what's climb departure speed uh, uses the less trip fuel? Well, the answer is BY. And the, the reason is that uh, the BY is the best rate of climb because it ensures that the aircraft reaches its optimal cruise altitude as quick as possible. Uh, so the longer, we fly at cruise altitude, the less trip will burn. That's why it's uh, BY burn uh, less trip fuel. So remember this this concept uh, uh, referring to, to our uh, speed consideration on the A320. BX is a green dot speed. Uh, is, is the speed that we'll use to, uh, to clear uh, closing obstacles. And with, with this speed, we'll gain uh, height in the shortest uh, distance. It's the maximum lift to drag radio speed. On the other hand, BY is the best rate of climb. It's the will gain the altitude clear by ATC in the shortest time. So uh, imagine that we are departing from whatever airport, from, uh, for example, London Heathrow Airport and air traffic control uh, clear us, okay, GTA 005, climb to flight level 350, and give me your best rate of climb speed. Which, which speed will we will select in our flight control unit, in our PFT? So, well, according with our uh, manual on the Airbus, on the flight crew techniques manual, if we go to the, uh, we'll, 
review more in deep this concept during the tight writing course. If we go to the flight crew techniques manual to the uh, normal operation, uh, normal, yeah, normal operation speed, speed considerations, we'll find that uh, our best rate of climb on the A320 is turbulence speed. So you will find on the manuals, on the Q, QRS quick, quick reference handbook, that on the A320, the turbulence speed roughly is 250 or 260 knots until, until uh, up to flight level 200. And from flight level 200 up to flight level 330, that speed changed from 250 to uh, 280 knots, 280. And above this flight level, Two zero zero up to flight level uh, three seven zero. This speed will change to a uh, Mach point point seven six. So roughly, our uh, best angle of climb is green dot, and our uh, best rate of climb is a uh, turbulence speed. So flight level two five zero below below flight level two hundred. That's big, big, uh, big concept. Uh, that's a big figures, big number for uh, regarding our uh, speeds considerations. Well, factors, uh, factors affecting say, the climb performance is attitude. Well, we can imagine that the rate of climb decreases with increasing our uh, attitude. Mass, increased mass produces more induced drag as we discussed on the, uh, on the uh, first slides of this presentation, wind. A headwind increases the effective climb angle and tailwind uh, decreases the effective cl uh, climb angle. Temperature, well high, high temperature means a decrease in air density as you know and uh, reducing lift and especially for uh, jet aircraft engine thrust. Flaps position, the use of flaps increases li lift as well as drag. An increase in lift does not uh, influence climb performance. However, an increase in drag does. So as we discussed on the flap set in the previous slides, the use of flaps will reduce our climb performances. Well, contaminate runway. Uh, this concept is quite important as well. What's a contaminate runway? It's a runway in which more than 25 of the runway surface require length and width is, is covered by well, uh, more than three millimeters of uh, snow, slash, uh, in ice, including wet, wet ice. So to, to, this, to the question of 20% uh, covered runways are contam is, contaminate, is considered contaminated? No, the answer is no. It has to be more than this 25%. And the second question is we find in our runway, uh, well, uh, slash snow, um, ice less than three millimeters. According with the FCOM performance uh, manual, this uh, contamination the key, uh, equivalence is uh, we should consider this runway as wet as soon as this contamination is less than three millimeters. But if this contamination is more than three millimeters, we should go to the to the uh, uh, performance table just to calculate our performance figures for takeoff. Well, how does contaminant runway affect to the distance? For a given aircraft weight on contaminant runway, the emergency distance is, will be increased, uh, as we can imagine. And also a contaminant runway has a slower acceleration, so therefore our takeoff run required will increase as well. Well, difference between B1 and B weight, well, as you can imagine as well, in, in, in this concept, a dry B1 is the normal decision and speed that following an engine failure allows the, allows the takeoff to be continuous safely within our takeoff distance or be stopped safely within our accelerated stop distance. A wet B1 is uh, maximum speed for abandoning the takeoff on a contaminated runway. Well, big number, big figure as a rule, rule of thumb, a recommended wet, wet B1 for contaminated condition is dry B1 minus 10 knots. Well, this is the table that you will see more in depth during the entire writing course. In, uh, we, we will find this table in our quick reference manual. Uh, this is called uh, runway conditions assessment matrix. Depending on the contamination that we find on the runway, uh, think, just think about if, if we are, for example, say that we are in this um, 
in this, uh, in this case, dry is no more than three millimeters. Uh, we should bear in mind that uh, since the uh, contamination is more than three millimeters, this will affect to our braking action will be medium. And if we take a look to our de destination airports, it has, does have more than three millimeters. Our maximum cross wind landing is limited to 20 knots. This is quite important during the planning phase before getting to the airplane during the planning phase of our flight. Check this runway conditions assessment matrix. See how is our performance status, our contamination uh, status, weather conditions in the destination airport. And according with this table, our crosswind, our maximum crosswind limitation will be limits according with this uh, uh, assessment matrix that we, we work more in deep during site waiting course in DTA about this. We'll uh, talk about this co contamination concept, which is quite important. Well, noise abatement procedures, this is a quick refreshment for you guys. Uh, remember, uh, noise abatement procedure one, uh, what we are going to do is uh, passing 800 feet above ground level, where we usually take as a, a big number 1,000 feet. We'll take our thrust levers back from uh, flex MCT or toga thrust to climb, so we will reduce our thrust setting power, and we will continue climbing Keep climbing at the speed B2 plus 10 or B2 plus 20. And once we reach 3,000 feet, we'll start our level off and our cleanup phase. So uh, NADP1 will start our reduced power at 1,000 feet. It's a big number. And we'll keep climbing at B2 plus 20, B2 plus 10 and up to 3,000 feet. At 3,000 feet, we'll start our acceleration phase and clean up our uh, flaps condition. Well, uh, noise abatement procedure two. In this case, uh, uh, this uh, noise abatement procedure is designed to reduce uh, more distant, uh, well, noise reaction to more distant from the airport. NADP1 is to reduce this noise uh, in close in proximity from the airport. So in this case, the difference when we talk about NAPD2 uh, will at 800 feet, so roughly 1,000 1, feet altitude, will start our reduced power. Uh, at the same time, uh, in this case, we're reaching 3,000 feet, will uh, commence our, uh, our transition. So, the difference between NADP 1 and 2 is that in this case, uh, at 1,000 feet, when we talk about noise abatement procedure 2, we can take 1,000 feet, we'll reduce power, and we'll start as a, uh, our clean up condition at, at the same time. So in our performance page of, of our MCDU on the A320, will set 1,000 in our thrust reduction altitude, will set 1,000 feet uh, above ground level, and will set in our uh, acceleration altitude 1,000 feet as well, which is an ADP2. Well, we'll find which uh, noise abatement procedure to use uh, depending on which airport we, airport we are taking off from. We'll find, we can find this information in the general information airport charts. Well, how does runway length uh, affect the, uh, uh, to the takeoff performance? You can imagine on the runway length, next common sense, the longer the runway available, the greater, greater is the possible aircraft takeoff weight. Runway surface, a hard and dry surface, allows good acceleration on the ground and therefore reduces the takeoff run required for a given aircraft weight. Regarding the runway slope, downward slope allows the aircraft to accelerate faster. Therefore, the takeoff run required is for a given aircraft weight is reduced. Uh, on the other hand, in the upward slope, this upward slope hinders the aircraft acceleration. Therefore, the takeoff run required and required distance for a given aircraft weight are increased or the uh, aircraft maximum takeoff weight is reduced for a given uh, length, uh, runway length. Well, this Graph is quite useful, it's quite good to understand how performance, uh, uh, how the flap setting will affect our performance 
when, when we are performing a, a doing a landing and a, a approach and landing. First point, effect of flaps on landing point. Uh, if we use uh, flaps uh, full in case of the A320, which is the case, this is going to be, this will be our landing point. On the other hand, if we use flaps three, uh, our landing point will be farther more in deep to the, to the uh, runway length. So this will be that one. What about the, uh, how steep or flat is going to be, uh, will be our approach depending on our flap setting? Well, if we use flaps full, uh, our approach will be uh, steeper uh, and we will get a steeper descent angle compared with uh, flaps three in our in our case with flaps three our approach profile will be flatter Re remember that you will see in the type rating course that there are uh, quite a few difference quite a few concepts to take in account when we are landing when we decide to land with flaps full, full or three for example if, if we are landing in high gusting or conditions or we have uh, under wind shear condition maybe it's good it's, it's, it's good, good idea using flaps three for landing especially uh during wind shear condition the reason is that in case of go around when we are using flaps three for the uh, for for, for uh, approach and landing in case of go around our climb performances will be much better when we are changing flaps from three to two. So that's one of the main uh, advantages of landing with flaps three. But on the other case, our, as you can see in this graph, our landing point will be different. Our uh, approach profile will be different as well. And our speed at threshold will be higher. So well, well, there are quite a few considerations to take into, into account to when we decide that if we land with uh, flaps three or full. Well, how will uh, the use of flaps will affect our landing performances? Increased flap settings decrease the landing distance required, as we uh, discussed on the previous slide. The flap deployment increase lift and reduces stall speed. Therefore, the approach at threshold is less, when, uh, which result in a shorter landing distance. The higher the flap deployment is, the uh, greater uh, the greatest that of dynamics drag that helps helps to slow the aircraft down and result in a shorter landing distance required. That's what we said when we decide to use flaps full in this case. And the higher the flap setting and the steeper the approach path, the lower is the forward velocity and momentum on the landing. That's why it's so important this concept of uh, momentum or uh, aircraft uh, inertia. Well, we all know what's flex takeoff. In many cases, the aircraft takeoff at weights lower than the maximum permissible takeoff weight. And when this happens, uh, it can meet the requiring performances without decreased thrust that, uh, that is adapted to the, to the weight. This is called flex, uh, flexible takeoff. Remember that this concept, flexible or flex takeoff, preserve engine light does not save fuel. And the reason is that if we take of using maximum thrust, in this case, toga thrust, will use our uh, cruise altitude earlier. And the longer we fly at our cruise altitude, the less fuel will burn for the, for, for, for the uh, total flight. Well, the pilot, uh, can you flex takeoff when the actual takeoff weight is lower than the per, uh, maximum permissible takeoff weight? Uh, thrust must not be reduced by, by more than 25% of the thrust. And this is quite important as well. Remember that flex, flexible takeoff is not permitted on contaminated runway. So when we are taking off from contaminated runway, we'll, we'll use always TOGA maximum thrust. Well, this is quite uh, easy. And just to give you a quick general idea uh, how to work with the performances, uh, takeoff performance calculation. Well, this is an, an example. We are taking off from London Heathrow Airport, runway 27 left. Our takeoff weight will be uh, 60, 60, 60, 66 tons. And our weather condition is wind 270, 10 knots, uh, two degrees temperature, overcast, overcast 100 feet, sour rain, Q8, 10, 10, and the runway is wet. So in this case, we'll get into our performance chart. Uh, we can decide if you use config one or config two, make sure that this is our runway, 27 left and London Hero Airport. 
run with, right? So say that since uh, uh, the runway land is quite, Hydro has quite a long runway, so we'll decide to use uh, config one for departure. Uh, since the wind is 270, 10 knots, we'll, we'll have to get into the table through this column headwind 10 knots. Our gross weight is 66 tons, so we have to go to this, this uh, column and run the table. So initially our figures, our speed will be 150, 150, and 150, and our flex temperature 66. And then we go to with the corrections. Since the runway is wet, for this correction, we have to subtract minus two knots to this uh, uh, B1 speed. So now our speed will be uh, 148, 150, and 150, and same for the flex temperature 66. Well, what about the QNA's correction? Since our QNA is below 1013, is below 1013, so we'll go to the um, QNA's corrections and we have to subtract minus minus two degrees to the flex temperature. So now our flex temperature will be 64 instead of 66. Well, then you will find this other table corrections on the performance manual. If we finally decide, since the temperature is quite low, we decide to use uh, engine anti ice on for departure, we have to subtract minus five degrees to the flex temperature um, well, and minus 300 kilos to the takeoff weight. So finally, with all these corrections, I mean, with weight runway, QNA below 1013, and the engine anti ice on, our final figures will be speeds 148, 150, 150, and our flex temperature 61. And we'll uh, said we'll put all these entries on our MCDU uh, performance page for takeoff. Well, remember that it's, it's possible to fly without motors, but uh, not without uh, knowledge and skills. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, coming this course, for staying here with us. Thanks for watching. And uh, well, thanks for watching. And thanks for being here with us in, uh, in uh, DTA, Global Training Aviation, today. Uh, I hope that you, ha you all have enjoyed this uh, first part of the uh, Jet Oriented course. Um, well, uh, stay safe these days. Hope to see you in the next sessions. Um, yeah, we'll take a look to the next uh, next part number two of this uh, this course, which is quite interesting regarding the A320 uh, substance. Well, thanks for watching. My pleasure, and stay safe. Bye bye.